Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, testing. Hi, Matt. Did you remember to push the record button? Last time you forgot and you had to re-record the entire introduction. Who said that? Me. I'm your inner dialogue. You can call me IDM. That's short for inner dialogue man. Okay. Hi, IDM. <clears throat> I feel, uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm recording an introduction to a podcast here. I know. Do you realize that you are terrible at podcasting? You're obviously reading from a script and you look like you're a deer caught in headlights. Maybe you should try mixing up a little bit. Okay, um, like how? You'll think of something. Before you record, why don't you tell me a little bit about your topic? I'm talking about learning communities. I'm also talking about the Marine Lab and the Herpetarium. Okay, uh, sounds kind of interesting. What's a learning community? Well, nobody can say for sure. What? All right, so, so you don't know what a learning community is. There really isn't a good, clean definition that everyone can agree on, but Basically, it's a group of people who have common academic goals and attitudes. They have become really popular in colleges and universities in the U.S. There's uh, residential learning communities, and there are non-residential learning communities. Hey, don't tell me. Tell, tell the camera. Okay. In, in residential learning communities, students live together and share common extracurricular activities. Today, we'll be talking about the non-residential learning communities. According to a 1999 paper by George Washington University professor Karen Kellogg, there are five types of non-residential learning communities commonly found throughout the literature. The first type are linked courses, where groups of students take the same two courses together. Usually one is content-based and the other is application-based. We do this at BGSU. For example, many of our freshman biology majors will take a biology course and a psychology or philosophy course together. So they see the same people in both classes and hopefully get to know each other better. The second type is called a learning cluster, where groups of students take three or four courses linked together. The third type is called freshman interest groups, which are similar to linked courses, but also include a peer advising component. An upperclassman serves as a peer advisor and meets with the freshmen weekly. The fourth type is called a federated learning community, where students take linked courses and a professor from a different discipline called a master learner takes the courses with the students. The master learner meets with the students regularly to discuss the courses. The fifth type is called coordinated studies, where a group of students and faculty work together on a full-time block of courses, which may last an entire year. There's just five types of non-residential learning communities. No, there are actually many more types of non-residential learning communities. We have two live animal labs here in the biology department at BGSU that I would like to talk about today. They don't fit into any of the five common categories I just listed, but they're definitely learning communities, bringing faculty and students together on a regular basis to pursue the same academic goals. In the marine lab, students take care of aquariums and work on aquatic research projects. In the herpetarium or reptile lab, students take care of reptiles and do reptile research projects. There are also professional learning communities where like-minded professionals get together and talk about topics related to their profession. I facilitated a bunch of professional learning communities for faculty where we got together and talked about all aspects of teaching and learning. Sounds interesting, but are there any benefits to learning communities? It sounds like a complicated scheduling nightmare. Scheduling can be difficult, but there's a huge body of literature around this indicating a huge number of benefits. According to Karen Kellogg, benefits for students include increases in academic achievement, retention, motivation, intellectual development, learning, and involvement in community. Faculty can be re-energized, empowered, feel valued, become more creative, and more committed to the college or university. Distinguished Syracuse University sociology professor Vincent Tinto studied student retention and learning communities. In a 1994 paper, he explains that learning communities provide a strong sense of belonging for students, and a strong sense of belonging is key to student retention in a college or university. 
Nice job. Looks like you found a fairly interesting topic and you've done your homework. Now quit wasting everybody's time and introduce your guest. Today's guest is an associate professor of biological sciences at BGSU. She's been faculty at BGSU since 1985 and the director of the BGSU Herpetarium since 1997. Her research interests include developmental genetics, reptile and amphibian husbandry, egg incubation, as well as student engagement and attitudes. She's a good friend, colleague, and mentor. Please welcome Dr. Eileen Underwood. Welcome to the Teaching and Learning Professor, where you will find interviews of college faculty, staff, administrators, students, and alumni every week. Topics cover all aspects of formal and informal learning in higher education. The goal of this podcast is to help faculty understand the best ways to teach and for students to understand the best ways to learn. Your host is a teaching professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Bowling Green State University. He's been faculty and the director of the BGSU Marine Lab since 1999. Now on to the show with your host, Dr. Matthew L. Parton. All right, so welcome, Dr. Underwood. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Parton. I guess I would like to start off by asking you to talk a little bit about your background. Okay, I have a BS in biology from St. Lawrence University in upstate New York, a B, an MA in zoology from Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, and a PhD in molecular cell and developmental biology also from IU Bloomington. I did a five-year postdoc at UCLA doing molecular genetics in Drosophila, and I came to BGSU in 1985. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was a student here uh, after that time. Mm -hmm. and, yep, and I remember you here, and uh, you worked in the genetics lab yep. with the fruit flies. With fruit flies up on the fourth floor. <laughs> All right, so that's... Uh, uh, You've been here since, uh, what, you said 85, and then mm -hmm. you started the herpetarium at what time? Okay, I went on sabbatical in 1996, and I came back from sabbatical with a fairly sizable constrictor snake collection, only to find out that Bowling Green, the city of Bowling Green, has a no constrictor ordinance. And at that point, it was kind of like, oh, okay, well, I converted a molecular genetics lab into the herpetarium. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, of course, no constrictors, and you have to have your cat on a leash and all kinds of other fun laws. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Bowling Green has some interesting <laughs> animal control ordinances. You've done lots and lots and lots of learning over the years, teaching yourself how to do things. You've obviously studied formally and informally how to take care of reptiles and teaching these skills to your students on a regular basis. So, I want to ask you what is your favorite or your preferred method? of learning yourself? Learning, are we talking about academic learning or are we talking about hands-on learning? Both. I do them very differently. For academic learning, I read first, then try doing things, and then go back and read again <laughs> to figure out what I didn't get right the first time. Repetition helps a lot. For things like working with the animals, it's been talking to people. Because when I started doing this, there wasn't that much written about most of the animals that we have in the herp lab. And so I made a point of, you know, talking to people who are breeders, who work with the animals regularly. And that's where I would end up getting animals for the herp lab. I also was part of the Colorado Herp Society when I was on sabbatical out in Denver. And I learned a lot out there from people who work with the animals regularly. And then I came back to Bowling Green, set up the herp lab, and worked through generally a small number of species to begin with. And I started offering seminars for undergraduates, dealing with, you know, one semester it might be geckos, another semester it might be dragons, another semester it was snakes. And initially at the end of each semester, I would ask the class, what animal, within reason, should we add to the collection? So while this collection started out with, I believe, 25 constrictor snakes and maybe half a dozen species of lizard, it kind of gradually got bigger and bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you've grown quite a bit. So you used to be up on the fifth floor, and now you're down here on the first floor. And I moved down here when this, the Drosophila Species Center moved. 
wonderful being on the first floor because that way all of the stuff that I have to bring in, I mean, I do grocery shopping every week because a lot of our animals eat greens. We need <laughs> carrots. We need sweet potatoes, normal people food. I buy 20 rolls of paper towels a week. <laughs> um, and it's just more convenient to just park in the loading dock and bring the stuff in for students to be able to use. Oh, right. I'm sure. Yeah. For academic learning, you prefer to read first and then read again and then keep reading. I, and I'm the same way. I, 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 I like to read everything I can about a topic first. And then I start asking questions. To, you know, I'll find experts and start asking questions. I'm not sure that I read everything I can first. I try and find something that's relatively simple. Generally, you know, kind of like books like Dummies for right, whatever. Right. Um, I look at those first. And then I find doing something first, trying, you know, once I've, I've done the basic reading, so I know how, what not to do, then I try working it out hands-on stuff. And then I go back and look up and see, okay, this worked, this didn't work. What can I find in the literature? that supports what I'm trying to do. As I said, a number of the species over the years that we have worked with in the herp lab, there wasn't much out there on. I can remember, oh, probably when I first moved downstairs, and initially the herp lab was up on the fourth lab, fourth floor. I was up there for several years and then moved down here. Um, shortly after I moved down here, I remember bringing in one of the librarians to talk to our seminar class about the best way for students to be researching these animals, to put together a presentation and a formal document about care of, in this case, it was viper geckos. Nice, cute little lizard that we had in the lab, highly prolific, but only lived for two or three years because they made so many babies. Um, but he came back to me and said he was having trouble because at that point, the only thing, he couldn't find anything in the scientific literature. All he could find was in, you know, your normal Google search, although at the time I'm not sure it was Google. And the very first thing that popped up was reference to the Herp Labs care sheet. <laughs> and of course, this is a species we no longer maintain. You know, yeah, over yeah. time, things change. That was an, an organism that the hatchlings are about two centimeters long. And so you had to have eighth inch crickets, which meant we had to get food in every week. And it ended up being a little bit too expensive. And they're a little bit harder to maintain, so we kind of moved away from that species. And again, you know, as we go through phases in the lab, and a lot part is what the students want to work with. So you kind of let the students, you give them a little bit of autonomy in what you guys, what they want to study and what directions they would like to? To some extent, yes. And initially for the first 20 years we had the lab, the animals were my private property, and therefore I was under total control. Now, Animal Care and Use Committee, I did have protocols, I did have to have approval for what we were doing, but it worked very nicely because the university didn't own the animals. Since I'm getting close to retirement um, and the IACUC has changed, the people who are on it, we have a different attending vet um, at this point, we have to transition the animals over to university ownership. So at the current position, I own the adults um, because I'm the one who bought them all but any offspring that we have belong to the university. And one of the ways we fund the lab is by selling the offspring. So I go to reptile shows twice a month, one down in Columbus, one up in Taylor, Michigan. There are lots more than that, but I'm not willing to give up more than two Saturdays a month to run the lab. But the, the key feature here is now it becomes a little more problematic. I can't just say, oh, cool species, the students would like this and add it to the collection. We're kind of I'm not saying shutting it down, but we're at least slowing down and reducing the collection size down so that once I leave and I'm no longer inputting a fair amount of the money that it goes to run the space, the university is willing to continue funding it. What's, what, do you, what is your preferred method for teaching? I've taught for 35 years now, and my method has changed significantly. When I first started, it was straight lecture. You know, I had notes, and I went through them, and I wrote a lot of stuff on the blackboard. And then it was transitioning from chalk to overhead projectors, which was nice because it gave you a, a record that you could share with students. And then we got into computers and PowerPoints. I still use PowerPoints to some extent. Considering how bad my handwriting is on a blackboard, it makes it a little bit easier when the students can actually... <laughs> 
read my writing because it's PowerPoint. Um, it's also something that is then I post on Canvas. But I've gotten away from that. Most of the large lectures that I have, introductory biology, I use undergraduate learning assistants. And they've made all the difference in the world. Now, it's funny to read student evaluations at the end of the semester. About half of the kids wish we'd done more in-class activities, and the other half wished I did more straight lecture. You're right. I try to do a mixture of the two. I do a lot of case studies. Since a large number of students who take biology 2050 are going into nursing or one of the health science professions, pre-med, pre-vet, I like for them to see why it is important applications of what they're learning so that hopefully they'll actually retain it a little bit better. The frustrating part is students really need to learn to scan the book at least browse through the chapter before coming to class. That gets their brain thinking about the types of material that they're going to be presented with. Then actually take notes. It's very frustrating. And yes, I love to think that, yes, I'm in, in, engaging enough that people just want to hear what I say. But the reality is, if you're going to retain what you're learning, have a piece of paper in front of you. Even <laughs> if you just write an occasional word down, it actually helps you maintain focus on what's going on. And then after class, they need to go back and look at the book again and fill in any of the gaps. We do need to make sure students realize that it's not high school anymore. You're not getting all of the material. 80% of what you need to do isn't during class time. You're expected for every one hour of class to put in two to three hours of study time. Don't put it all off until two days before the exam. You know, learn regularly. And I realize that there are some students who do this automatically, and there's a lot of students, really bright students, who never had to do this in high school, and therefore they struggle when they first get to college. You're, you're uh, known here in the department as an active learning teacher. You do lots of activities in your courses, and as you mentioned, you use learning assistance. Could you define learning assistance? I'm going to have an episode later. I'm going to get Dr. Sermon here to talk about okay. that, but you give a, just a brief, <laughs> a brief overview. One. Okay. Undergraduate learning assistants, or what we call LAs, are students who've taken the course and done well in the course and are willing to come back into the classroom. They're in lecture all the time. They're assigned in my classes, three groups of six students, so that when we do in-class activities, they have 15 to 18 students that they're in charge of, you know, so that, and the, the key feature, and I know this is frustrating for students in the class, the first couple activities we do, the LAs aren't supposed to give answers, not direct answers when a student asks a question. They answer a question with a guiding question. So like Yoda. <laughs> like Yoda. The idea being that it helps students realize what they need to know on their own. And that makes a big difference. After about Halfway through the semester, by then the, student, the, the students in the class are at least used to this. So that, that, you know, and I've had some of them say, yeah, I know you can't answer, but how are you going to direct me on this one? And it does help. The LAs get to know these students. You know, if you've got 150 people sitting in front of you, I end up maybe knowing one or two students' names. I will admit I am terrible with names. Um, I always have been. But the LAs get to know all their students' names. They offer review sessions. They offer study sections. They help organize the class. They, they let me know when something I've proposed to put on an exam isn't something that they think any of the students taking the class will understand or remember, and therefore we modify things. And so they've had experience in the classroom, and yet they're helping direct the activities. You used to teach primarily just traditional lectures. So you'd stand yes. up in front of the class in these large lecture halls with 200 students and just go through the notes yep. and the, in order of the book, which is, you know, that, I have to admit that's how I started out as well. It's comfortable. <laughs> it's much easier. You're prepared. You yes. are in charge of the whole lecture. And it's very easy to control the pace of the course. <laughs> when you're in, in active learning mode, yeah, controlling can be challenging. Sometimes it takes longer. Other times you whip through the material and it's like, oh, what am I going to do next? I'll admit I have a full schedule that is not what the students see. It's what I'm planning on doing. And it includes notes like 
I'm giving an exam on Monday, and I need to make sure before they take the exam that they know, okay, for Wednesday's class, there's 30 minutes worth of videos that they have to watch and take an online quiz, you know, just to get them so that they're prepared. Um, those type things they actually come prepared for class because they've had to answer something in advance. So you found that your active learning sessions go a lot better if your students come prepared in order for them to make oh, yes. sure that they are prepared. <laughs> yes. You quiz them. That makes yeah. sense. It's not just because you're mean and you want to see them suffer taking a quiz. Or... No, and you can, it's really kind of funny because you can tell the kids who've done the reading or watched the videos because they're finished in two or three minutes. You know, they're not hard quizzes, questions. They're, they're, right. If you've watched it, the answers are right there. And especially when it's a take-home thing they do before they come to class, they can look up the answers right in front of them. Now, one of the things I will say is cell phones. I'm sure a lot of people will address this right. in your various things. There are times when I will say in class, it's a cell phone free day. Put them away. I don't even want to see them on the desktop. And I've told my LAs, and unfortunately, this has become a problem in past semesters. So I start out right from the start saying, okay, on a cell phone free day, if your LAs see you on your phone, they confiscate the phone, put it on the desk up front, and you can get it at the end of class. Now, having said that, I've not had a problem since then. <laughs> I've, you know, they, students get one warning. They get a tap on the shoulder. And especially if I'm the one walking around and see them on their cell phone, right. you know, it's like, okay, busted. You know, you do it again, we take the phone. It interrupts your train of thought. I find myself, if I have to, I never brought a cell phone to class before. Now that we, if I have to get on Canvas, I have to have the <laughs> cell phone for dual authentication. It's very frustrating, but my cell phone has to come with me. But it's always on silent and it gets put away afterwards. It is distracting. And if you break your train of thought, even if it's just, oh, I want to answer, respond to this text real quick. No, you've broken your train of thought and it's hard to get it back again. And it makes a big difference. And for those of you in large lecture halls, please be aware the cell phone in your lap is generally right at eye level for the faculty member. <laughs> we, we may think you're playing with your crotch, but the reality is you're playing with your cell phone. Um, and we can see it. And it, it's also distracting for the person up front talking. So as well as people sitting near you. Right. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of students are unaware, but I'll have others that will come in and they'll complain about that. And they'll say, yeah. hey, there's this person texting around to me. It bothers me. Yeah. And, um, and I... I, I Really let students have their laptops open. There are a lot of activities that we do that they have to go on to the internet. And on those days, yes, you can use your cell phone or you can use your laptop. Um, there have been times when I've, when I realized that almost no one is taking notes and it's important that the terminology be learned so that they really be, do need to be jotting down the things that I'm emphasizing in the times when I do lecture, I'll randomly say at the end, okay, Put everything away. You can leave your notes out and you can answer this question using your notes, which, you know, in my brain says my, my initial response is close your computers. And of course, then I've had students say, but I take notes on the computer. <laughs> and it's like, OK, your L.A.s are watching to make sure you're staying on your notes and you're not going out in Google. The other thing mentioning Google, I will mention is that Google does not always give correct answers. I had one activity that was given as a homework, and I warned students, you know, don't just assume the first link has the answer you need. Look at more than one, because at least one of the questions that I had asked, the very first link that pops up gives an incorrect answer. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what is the inheritance patterns of straight versus curly hair? You know, if you have someone with curl naturally curly hair and a person with straight hair, what will their kids look like? The answer is wavy because it's incomplete dominance. But the very first site that pops up says that curly hair is dominant. So it sounds like active learning is a whole lot more work than your traditional lecture type course. So why did you transition from a traditional lecture course to an active learning course? Okay, I, I must admit I've been doing it since 2012 and I did it gradually but I noticed that the students did better on tests. I could give the exact same test and compare scores from one year, one semester to the next, and the units that 
when I had added the active learning, they were between 10 and 15% higher averages. No, that's, that's significant. Yeah, that's significant. Yeah. So I, I had many fewer students getting Ds or Fs. Now, I still have some. The people who don't come to class, well, you know, we do case studies. You need to know the material that's in the case study. The case study is not in the book. It reflects back on what the book's material is. But if right. you're not there, you're not going to know. Even if I post what I can of the case study on Canvas for the students to look at, they're not going to be able to answer those questions. Right. Back to the herpetarium. The, what pri what's the primary purpose or function of the herpetarium? It depends who I'm talking to. <laughs> if I'm talking to parents of students during preview days, there's multiple layers of it. Um, when I'm talking to myself, it's, man, to give the students a place to have fun, to learn about the animals, to learn how to take care of them. Um, one of the things that, that comes up, if you've got three dozen people working in a small space, you know, yes, people are in and out, working on different things, different animals, they're assigned different animals, they learn different things about the animals, but they're not only learning about the animals, but they're learning about how to get along with people. We jokingly say the herpetarium is a family, and my response is generally, yeah, you have squabbles just like you do between <laughs> brothers and sisters, and that, that does happen. Okay, now that we have video again, um, <laughs> the Herp Lab has multiple functions, and I can't say what its primary function is. It provides students a place to hang out together. It provides them with knowledge, hands-on experience working with the animals. It provides them with the opportunity to learn how to interact with bunches of different people. We have a large diversity of people that work in the lab. Um, at most, we can have three dozen people at a at a time. Well, not at one time, but per semester. Um, one semester, I tried letting everybody in who wanted to be in. We had 50 people and they were tripping over each other. There oh, were times yeah. when, because can... people have to be able to come in when they're not in class to do their right. assigned duties. We do have a large number of people who, even if they're not working in the lab that semester, they'll pop in periodically and just hang out. Part of what we do is maintain animals used to being handled gently, appropriately, so that when we do the school presentations on Thursday mornings with the bio lab tours, the animals are cool with being handled by school kids. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is, unlike fish, which swim around regardless, <laughs> um, we need to make sure that the animals are used to being handled. Um, when we do the school presentations, yes, there's always a volunteer who's been trained watching to make sure that the kids are holding them properly and not, not causing problems. But we also want the animals to be relaxed in those situations. And so there'll be times when people will simply come in and, oh, I got 15 minutes before my next class. Let me hold a ball python. Yeah. And so, and so I, I'll bring lots of school groups in to see the marine lab. And, you know, and the reason they're here is they, oh, yeah, there's this marine lab we heard about. But uh, I, I would say that every single school group that comes through, it's, it's the herp lab that steals the show. You know, you got lizards jumping on people's faces. And <laughs> now, not on the, well, yeah, they do occasionally jump on the face. Um, not very often. They do jump and they startle people. But yeah, it's the fact that it is hand, literally hands on, that the kids can hold stuff. I mean, the zoo is wonderful. They've got some great things, but generally you don't get to hold. You can hear talks about them. You can see them demonstrate. You can look at them in their cages. But one of the advantages of coming to BGSU's bio lab tours is, in the, at least for the herps, students get to hold the critters. They get to see that they're not as scary. They're not slimy. <laughs> I don't have a single slime. Well, we don't hold the frogs because frogs, the oils on our skin can actually be toxic to the frogs. So we don't hold those. But the snakes and the lizards and the one tortoise, they can hold. They can realize that they're not slimy. They, they, they're weird. They're different. But they're not necessarily something you have to be afraid of. Now, I always start with the caveat that, okay, folks, remember, these are captive bred used to being handled. With people say, oh, do you go out and catch snakes in the wild? No way. I enjoy looking at snakes in the wild, but I won't go near one. I want things that I know are used to being handled and are not going to try and bite me. 
I don't, you know, I've, I'll be honest, I've probably been bit by almost every species in the lab. Not every animal, but every species. And it's generally been my own fault. You know, if I smell like a rat because I've been thawing out rats and I get close to a hungry ball python, yeah, it's going to nip. And in that case, it's just a nip. They smell food. They go for the warmth and they, they realize as soon as they get their mouth around my hand that I don't taste like a rat and therefore they let go. Um, and then you simply wash your hands and say, I'll be better next time and use the tongs like I'm supposed to so they don't get the, the warmth of my hands confused with the smell of the rat. In what way would you say that the, the Herp Lab is a learning community? It's a group of students who all have similar interests. Their interest is in reptiles. They're interested in learning how to take care of them. They're interested in interacting with them. Um, and part of it, yes, it's a learning community about reptiles, but it's also a bunch of people who become friends. It's not unusual to see people setting up study groups for math classes. Genetics tends to be a big course when a number of the volunteers or people taking it for academic credit are in, also in a genetics class. They'll have study sessions sitting in the herp lab. You know, you got a ball python in your lap. You got a corn snake <laughs> or a bearded dragon sitting on your, your lap. But while you're working out genetics problems, while, you're, you're while they study for exams, I've noticed this semester especially, we've got some of the seniors who are helping to almost tutor the kids struggling in the first chemistry class because chemistry can sometimes be a problem for biology majors, you know, yeah, math and chemistry. By the time physics rolls around, they're usually seniors, so they've gotten past it. Yes. But, you know, so that they do, it's a learning community, not just about reptiles. It's about how to study, and they study together. And they, they end up going out. They eat a lot together. They do a lot of things together. So it's, it's forming a community of people, not just about the animals. Yeah, and, and I've seen that in the marine lab, same thing. Yes, you know, and I've been doing this long enough that I've watched my students pair off and they're dating and they get married and they have kids and careers of their own. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is definitely, I would say the Marine Lab and the Herp Lab are both communities of students. And I really wish there were more places like that, places where students can get together, a place to belong and a place where they can feel some ownership. And because it keeps them coming back. And I know that you and I have been trying to do a little bit of research, trying to, to demonstrate the importance and, and the, the, the benefits of these types of labs. I did have an honors student. Katie graduated a year ago. Her honors project was to look at the impact of the HERP lab on retention and time to graduation. It's based on data that you and I had collected in I think it was 2012 and 2014. So she had had enough time for the students who had been working in the labs at those times to have graduated. And we've got a comparison group from whoever it is on campus who does the institutional research, I guess it is. They yeah, came up with a, a pooled group based on incoming ACTs, GRE, um, ACT scores, high school GPAs. And they were all bio majors too. While Katie showed there was no significant difference between time to graduation, there was a significant increase in retention rate. So from they just happen so to lab. stay around, and, yeah. and and you would would and you believe that's because they feel like they have this place where yeah. they belong, place to hang out, a a, a group of like minded individuals. Yeah. Yes. Do they complain a lot about <laughs> chemistry and math, you know, and various courses generally just before they have to take an exam? But it gives them a, a group to talk to about it. Right. Similar interest and similar exposures. And then, you know, and, and let's let's look at Matt Parton back when he was a biology major <laughs> back a long time ago. And, you know, I had the same complaints. Oh, man, organic chemistry is hard. It's cool. And and I wanted to tell my friends about it, but I, there, I, there really wasn't a learning community uh, in, the, in the marine lab or the, the herp lab wasn't around then, yeah. uh, quite, quite like we have now. And, you know, I would tell my friends and they were not, some of them weren't even in college. Some of them, <laughs> yeah. they were majoring in other things and they, 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 they didn't, I don't think they really related uh, to my complaints about organic chemistry and calculus and yeah. Some of the courses. One of the things I've noticed with the Herp Lab, and I'm not sure if you have it in the Marine Lab, is 
not all of the people, now most of the people are bio majors, right. but not all of them are. Mm -hmm. I have a number of people who are art majors. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a number of, this semester I have a couple students who are bio majors, but glass blowing minors. And so that, you know, I've had math people, I've had geologists, they happen to like reptiles. So it also gives the people in the herp lab some exposure to other disciplines. Yes, it's nice when we can get a math major in there because then they can help with the calculus yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we'll get some of those in the Marine Lab. But actually, for a number of years, we had a business major who was the treasurer of the Marine Biology Association. Well, that so works well. Our money guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've had one business major, but we don't get that many from business. But yeah, so it's, I think it's a good experience for the students. Sometimes I like to liken it to in high school. People were in marching band, mm -hmm. and marching band was a family. Right. And the Herp Lab, the Marine Lab, people, when they come to BGSU, yes, I know that there are some students who come, and they still take part in marching band, and it has a similar influence. But the Marine Lab and the Herp Lab serve a similar purpose. Yes, you may be coming to an institution with, what do we have, 15, 18,000 students, right, undergrads? Right. But you're interacting with a small group. So it's, it's like you're a small college, not really a college, but it's a smaller group in a large campus. So it gives you a, a place to belong and not to feel left right. just out in the ozone. It, in, in, uh, it gives them an identity. So I am a herp person or I'm a marine lab <laughs> person. And we have a lot of people who end up doing both. Right. Yes, there's a lot. And then when they leave, they, they look for, many of them look for jobs in animal husbandry or teaching zoos education, or zoos or aquariums. And yeah, it's fun to see where they go. Because the, the, the student, the honor student I mentioned who did the analysis of the impact of the Herp Lab is currently working up at the Toledo Zoo. She's in charge of the insects <laughs> <laughs> for part of the museum up there. Oh, okay. Right. So, so yeah, she's so now an entomologist. She's an entomologist, <laughs> yes. All right. Well, Eileen, thank you very, very much for coming out here and doing this interview with me. Okay. And well, encourage your students to come visit the Herp Lab. Absolutely. I will. say hi. And anybody that happens to be listening to this podcast, please come visit <laughs> Dr. Underwood's Herpetarium. The Herp Lab is open Monday through Friday from nine to five. That way we will always have someone in the lab who can show people around. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Teaching and Learning Professor with Dr. Matthew L. Parton. If you like our show and want to know more, check out his webpage at blogs.bgsu.edu slash teachingandlearningprofessor. And please leave a review on iTunes, TuneIn, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you retrieve your podcasts.